10 years ago, I started my pre-med journey as a freshman at UCLA. And today I'm an anesthesiologist in New York City. Most people think getting into med school is near impossible. They have no idea where to even start. And over the years, helping thousands of pre-meds get into their dream med schools, I've learned that admissions is actually really simple, but that doesn't mean it's easy. So today we'll talk about the exact four steps I'd follow if I were a pre-med again, starting with step one, begin with the end in mind. This is an exact application that got me into UCLA Medical School. So literally everything that matters to adcoms lives in this document. We open up the application with my GPA and my MCAT score. Now, most pre-meds think that stats are simple. Get the highest grades you can, and that's that. What pre-meds get wrong is that taking the test is only half the battle. The secret is intentionally setting up your four-year plan. And now the most effective way to create that four-year timeline is to work backwards from that white coat ceremony. So before you earn an acceptance and go to your white coat ceremony, you have interviews. And right before interviews, you must submit your secondaries. And before your secondaries, you must submit your primary application. And most importantly is your MCAT should be complete by then. So at UCLA, where I went, the classes that I would recommend prior to taking the MCAT include Chem 14A and B, which were Gen Chem, C and D, which were O Chem, Physics 5A, B, and C, the entirety of the physics lab, LS 7A, B, and C, the entire of the intro to biology course, Biochem 153A, because Biochem is actually on this right here, third section. And then for the fourth section, UCLA did offer Psych 10 and Sociology 1. However, I did not find that they were representative of the MCAT. You don't really need to take those courses prior to studying for the MCAT. So if you count them up, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, eleven courses that I would recommend fitting into your schedule prior to taking the MCAT. And if we scroll back up here, you'll notice that there's not a lot of room to fit eleven courses. There's only one, two, three, four. If you take courses in the summer, five, six, really only seven quarters for you to knock out those eleven courses. So make sure that one, one and a half, two courses of that important list are on your course schedule for the first two years of your four-year timeline. When you plan with the end in mind, you now only have to focus on executing the plan. Feeling the confidence that this simple course schedule would get me into medical school allowed me to focus entirely on the course in front of me. Now that that's settled, we'll move on to the next part of the application, which is the work and activity section. And here's where ADCOM learn about your top 15 extracurriculars. They include your hobbies, your awards, your clinical experience, your research, everything. And that brings us to step two, define your pre-med archetype. I've read tens of thousands of medical school applications and every type of pre-med falls into one of four types. That's how med schools identify you. And in fact, ADCOMS has told me that that's how they remember you. This second step is arguably the most important because there is truly a perfect type for you. Here are the four archetypes. One, clinician researcher. Two, community health advocate. Three, teacher or mentor. And four, well-rounded pre-med. To be clear, you don't want to be that one. And to really understand this concept, you'll need to see strong extracurriculars and real examples of these archetypes. For example, my own application is a hybrid of community health advocates and teacher or mentor. And you can see my entire application on our application database. There you can find eight full AMCAS applications that earned acceptances to some of the best medical schools in the nation. Over 18,500 pre-meds are part of our community. To join, click the application database link in our description box below now. Once you've seen these applications, some will resonate with you more than others, and that's a huge sign you should be building towards that archetype. Don't worry, of course, you can be a mix of multiple, and of course, you can change your mind later. But for now, pick one. That is the fastest, most efficient way to build away from generic, mediocre, pre-med status. Once you've chosen your best guest archetype, then your entire attention should be devoted to developing this pre-med archetype. If you're a clinician researcher, that's finding a lab that you can dedicate years to. If you're a community health advocate, then it's finding the organizations that do the work for the people and the communities that you care about most. 
And if you're a teacher or mentor, start applying to be that Gen Chem or OCHEM TA. The earlier you land these extracurriculars, the better for two specific reasons. One, the opportunities you land initially may not be the most impactful. I had to try dozens of extracurriculars before I found the right mission, the right team, and I personally had the right skills to contribute. And two, impact takes time. If you're a junior wanting to apply with a no gap year timeline and you finally found your club, well, it's hard for anyone to get anything meaningfully done in three months. And now that we've built the foundations of a strong application, we're essentially even with the rest of the pre-meds in the country. So now we need to focus on how exactly we'll stand out. So that brings us to step three, stand out to add comps. I have never met a pre-med who got into a top five med school who didn't follow one of two rules. Number one is long-term games. Number two is the impact flywheel. Starting with one, when I entered college, I had zero relationships with actual professors and actual mentors. I struggled to find a PI, a doctor to shadow, an upperclassman who could tell me if I were doing the right things. And if you're anything like me, when you feel uncertain, your solution to that is the same as it was in high school. And that specifically is to grind harder, study more, and earn that 97 on your OCHEM test. But everything changed for me when I met Dr. Carlos Portera Callao. He was my first true mentor, and he put me in an environment that forced me to grow into the person and professional I am today. I became responsible for a small part of a research project. And week after week, I had someone who was counting on me that I had to report to. And even when life got busy, there were no accommodations. I just had to figure it out and come into lab at 5 a.m., far before my actual day got started. Getting into medical school is about what you can do. But what most pre-meds don't know is that you can only grow as a person when you have support from mentors, professors, and PIs. And all of this is captured in my letter of recommendation. In fact, here's the entire piece he wrote for me. And more than anything else on my application, I'm confident that that letter got me into my dream medical school. But of course, no pre-med guru is going to show you their actual letter of recommendation, show you their actual AMCAS application. They're certainly not going to talk about long-term relationship games because all of that is not sexy. It took three years of working day by day. And it's this attention to detail, this willingness to ignore the shortcuts that separate pre-meds who get into medical school from those who don't. If you're applying to medical school in the coming year or two, you don't wanna make the wrong decisions. Our pre-med catalyst students that submit their applications on time have a 100% acceptance rate. It's more than double the national average. And our results are because we work so closely with students. In fact, we can only take four students per month until we're full. If you'd be interested in getting into some of the strongest programs in the country, click the application cycle advising link to book a free strategy call before we are full for this cycle. Number two, the impact flywheel. Every adcom will talk about impact. And while I certainly agree with them, not a single adcom tells you how impact is created. So I read through hundreds of applications that got into the best medical schools in the country, and I created my own framework. So this is the impact flywheel, and everything starts with passion. It's impossible to create world-class impact, especially over years when you don't care about the thing that you are doing. To, and to be clear, passion isn't this extremely high bar. We're not talking about something that you'll want to dedicate a 30 year career towards. But I am talking about passion in that you're willing to spend early mornings and late evenings and weekends to give to the organization or push the project forward. And when you care about something, you naturally spend more time with it. You volunteer an extra quarterly health fair, maybe you pick up a smaller experiment in the lab, and that time is key because that drives the development of skill. And skill can be procedural, like you know how to run the gel electrophoresis efficiently. It can also be more subtle, like after working with four different vendors, this specific one is best for your community to enroll in health insurance. And that skill is what ultimately drives real impact. And now that you've made some progress, have some impact, you can now share in your lab meeting, maybe your first set of data. You have now added health insurance to your quarterly health care offerings. Maybe you've successfully actually enrolled five real patients. Those results, that impact is directly attributable to your time and your skill. And then when your PI tells you you did a great job and you help real patients get actual care, that in turn makes you more passionate and the wheel goes round and round. You care more because you did great work. You spend more time because you care more. You get better because you spent more time and you make a larger impact because of the skill you developed. And this is the flywheel that is how exactly you get to world-class impact. Now you have an exact blueprint on how to stand out 
how to formulaically step-by-step -step create impact. It's certainly simple, but it doesn't mean that it's easy. But there is one way to make this entire journey easier. And that brings us to the fourth and final step. Step four, don't repeat mistakes that have already been made. Every parent has the same goal to get into medical school. And yet the majority, 60%, don't get into a single school. It might be that some pre-meds follow different frameworks. Truthfully, if you thought it were the frameworks we talked about today, honestly, most pre-meds follow the exact same ones. The difference, of course, is the execution of those frameworks. And the easiest way to get ahead is to know what to expect so you can execute properly and make fewer mistakes. So here are the three core concepts to deeply internalize. Number one, being average. You will meet many pre-meds and the majority of them will not become doctors. It's because they're average pre-meds who do average things and get average results. And when the average pre-med submits an average of 25 schools and gets an average of zero acceptances, you'll want to give yourself a license to be above average. Concept number two, Confucius never said he was wise. The pre-meds you hear about most are the loudest ones. And yet, interestingly, over the last six years I've had advising thousands of pre-meds, they are paradoxically the least successful ones. After this video, you have your blueprint for success. Execute it. It's all you need. And do so in silence. Nobody else needs to know. Concept number three, choose your hard. Getting into med school is hard. You'll wake up at 5 a.m. to get into lab. Then you'll have to ace your 19 units from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Of course, you'll have to squeeze in your problem sets and the essay you have to draft and then club meetings start at 8 p.m. And when you get home dead tired, it's impossibly hard to go ahead, sit down and draft 100 emails to ask for shadow. Worst of all, you muster up the courage, you send out those emails and you still get zero responses. That's definitely hard to do day after day, but it's also hard to cruise through undergrad, apply to 30 med schools and have zero acceptances. It's also very hard to reapply to medical school when your application sucks. Everything is equally hard. The beautiful thing is you get to choose your heart. If you like this video, you'll love this one here where I talk about 10 hard truths I wish I knew when I started my pre-med journey 10 years ago in UCLA. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.